So next up, we're going to change gears and talk a little bit about electrocardiography, an ECG mimic. Now, I've got 10 minutes, so I think the title of this was Tricks and Mimics, and I'm only going to talk about one mimic, and I'm going to really try to pound this mimic into your heads over the next 10 minutes or so. So again, back to a real case, real case. 45-year-old male who was not feeling well, complaining of palpitations, no surprise. Blood pressure is 115, so not too bad. And what you see up here is this wide complex tachycardia, looks fairly regular. And so what is your drug of choice? All right, now you could say my drug of choice is propofol followed by 200 joules. And I would not argue with that, all right? Fantastic, it's fast, it's reliable, kind of fun. You bill more for it also. But let's say that this patient is wide awake and he's like, no, give me a drug. What is your drug of choice? Well, I'll tell you what the, the physicians in this case use. Again, this is a real case. They chose amiodarone. Now, if you know me, I'm not a big fan of amiodarone. I like procainamide a lot more for regular wide complex tachycardias. But if you substitute procainamide or lidocaine for this, you get the same outcome. This patient brady down and died. And I found out about the case a little while later on. We'll go back to what we're actually looking at. This is a regular wide complex tachycardia. Maybe it's just a tiny bit irregular. But when I see something like this, instead of calling it an RWCT, what I actually call this is an RRWCT. And what does the extra R stand for? Regular, really wide complex tachycardia. It's not just wide, it's really wide. And what I mean by that is that when you see the QRS complexes greater than one big box, greater than 200 milliseconds, I don't want you to ever think about VTAC as your number one diagnosis. The first diagnosis I want you to think about whenever you see a regular, really wide complex tachycardia is tox or metabolic. And this is so important because if you follow standard ACLS, what does ACLS tell you to do when you see a wide complex tachycardia? Lidocaine, amyl, or procainamide. All of those are sodium channel blockers. And if you give this patient a sodium channel blocker, it is what I refer to as a clean kill. It's a very reliable way of killing a patient. Whenever you see the really white complex tachycardia, just give strong consideration to empiric use of calcium and bicarb. Because if you go with ACLS, ACLS will kill this patient. All right. Remember, ACLS was never written for tox or metabolic patients. ACLS was written for the 65-year-old man who smokes two packs per day of cigarettes, who eats cheesesteaks for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, who one day clutches his chest and falls to the ground. That is who ACLS is written for. You can go out to the casinos or on Las Vegas Boulevard. That is what ACLS was written for. <laughs> Honestly, it wasn't really intended for a lot of patients that we see in the emergency department. And if you employ ACLS, this is one of those conditions where ACLS will kill your patient. And remember, what's the first law of medicine? Premium, no kill them, okay? And if you follow ACLS, you are going to kill this patient really, really, really quickly. This was hyperkalemia. The patient's potassium was 9.2. Again, a real case that was seen at one of our hospitals up on the floor, actually. This was an inpatient who, for whatever reason, developed hyper-K. And the medicine folks that saw this, the inpatient physicians that saw this patient thought this is a wide complex tachycardia, ACLS tells you, give them amio, amio is good for everything. Procainamide would have done the same thing. Lidocaine would have done the same thing also. And we've seen those cases in our own practice and learned from those mistakes. So now you learn from the mistakes that we made. When it's really wide, do not use any of the sodium channel blockers that ACLS tells you to. Why is it? Well, hyperkalemia is actually a sodium channel poisoned condition. Hyperkalemia poisons the, sanal, the sodium channel. So it's almost like having a tricyclic overdose. And you would never want to use a sodium channel blocker if your sodium channels are already screwed up. All right? So stay away. That's the whole lecture right there. All right? But I'm going to show you a handful more cases just to really, really hammer home this key point. This is a 42-year-old man, short of breath and weakness. It's a wide complex tachycardia, but it's a regular, really wide complex tachycardia. Take a look. Normal VTAC just doesn't get that wide. When you're looking at something that's greater than 200 milliseconds, think tox and metabolic first. Just give them some calcium and bicarb. If it is tox or metabolic, you're going to see the QRS narrow right before your eyes within a couple of minutes, within a minute or two. If it 
narrows before your eyes, it's not VTAC. VTAC doesn't do that when you give the bicarb or the calcium. On the other hand, if you give the calcium and bicarb and nothing happens, then fine, go ahead, call it VTAC and use the others. But first think about calcium and the bicarb first. Sometimes people say, well, what if it really is VTAC and I give calcium and bicarb? What's the harm? What happens if somebody truly has VTAC and you give them a couple amps of bicarb? What happens to them? Nothing. If I gave everybody in this room two amps of IV sodium bicarb, nothing happens. It gets metabolized and it's out of your system in about 15 minutes or so. What happens if you give calcium to somebody who's not actually hyper-K? What happens to them? Right? Their bones get stronger. It's great, right? There's no harm at all. There's no harm. Just try the calcium. If it's hyper-K, you just saved a life. If it's not hyper-K, no harm, all right? So a few more cases. Take a look. This is another hyper-K. The patient's potassium was in the upper sevens. This is a patient that was severely acidotic from sepsis. This was misinterpreted as VTAC. It's too wide for VTAC. The other thing, as we mentioned earlier in the lecture, uh, the first lecture, is too slow. VTAC has to have a rate of at least 120 or 130. The rate here is only about 110 or so at most. This is too slow for VTAC. This is either tox or metabolic. When it's slow and really wide, tox or metabolic, the patient here got some amiodarone and Brady down and died again. The reason for this, why did this person Brady down and die? It wasn't a sodium channel problem, but it's not well known, not marketed this way, but amiodarone is actually a beta blocker and calcium channel blocker, right? Amiodarone is marketed as a class three antiarrhythmic potassium channel stabilizer. In reality, amiodarone is class one, two, three, and four. Class one, sodium channel blocker. Class two, beta blocker. Class four, calcium channel blocker. Would you ever give a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker to somebody with a slow, wide, complex tachycardia? Of course not. There's no reason to. And what happened? The amiodarone was given, and they Brady down and died. All right? This patient needed bicarb. Here's hyper-K. You see the answer up there. It's 8. Rate's 115. So right off the bat, you know it's too slow. And let's take a closer look. It's way too wide. This has to be tox or metabolic. Look how wide that is. And if you follow the EKG machine, it's going to have you kill this patient. Just like we said yesterday in the EKG conference, who programs EKG machines? Plaintiff attorneys. They want you to kill the patient. Right? That's how they make their money. They want you to kill the patient. So don't ever believe that interpretation at the top. Here's another one. Nortriptyline overdose, sodium channel blocker overdose. It's too wide, and by the way, it's only about 115. It's too slow to call it ventricular tachycardia. Give some calcium. Calcium won't help here, but it won't hurt. And give some bicarb. You'll see the QRS narrow right in front of your eyes. Here's a flecainide toxic patient. Take a look at V1. That's way too wide to call it VTAC. When it's, that's, when it's that wide, just try some calcium and try some bicarb. You'll see the QRS narrow right before your eyes, and you'll have your diagnosis. This is a great case. This is from one of my former attendings from residency. He's a program director down in Florida. He took care of this patient. They didn't know the potassium was 8.8. It's a regular, wide, complex tachycardia. Everybody around him is saying, Dale, give the patient amio, give him procainamide, do something. The patient's got VTAC. He said, nope, it's too wide, and the rate is just a little bit too slow. So he said, you know what, let's just try some calcium bicarb. He gave one gram of calcium, two amps of sodium bicarb, bam, take a look at what happens. It narrows down, converts, you've got your diagnosis. This is just hyperkalemia. If he had treated this patient with lidocaine, amyl, or percainamide, he would have killed those so sodium channels. He would have ended up killing the patient, all right? So, simple take-home point. This is a common mimic in the emergency department. Many other specialties don't see this. We see this oftentimes in the ED. We see hyper-K all the time. We see overdoses all the time. When you see regular, really wide complex tachycardia, don't call it VTAC until after you've tried some calcium and bicarb. If you do that, you'll save a life. If you go right to ACLS, some of your patients will end up dying. When in doubt, go with the calcium and sodium bicarb. All right, that's it. Thanks a lot.